Okay, thank you very much for having me here, and I'm glad to be here back. Uh, um, I, I want to show you something. Uh, for those of you who are capable of uh, seeing it, um, this, is, uh, this is a clock. It looks like a clock. It is a clock. It's an electrical clock. Okay? In, in, uh, and, the, uh, and the letters are in, in Farsi. But actually, this is the story of the Iranian, the, the true nature of the Iranian nuclear program. I, I came across this electrical clock um, hang on the wall of the Deputy Director General of the IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, a UN organization based in Vienna, in charge of promoting the idea of nuclear technology for uh, peaceful purposes, for agriculture, medicine, industry, for, for humankind, for the good of humankind. And um, the Deputy Director General of the IAEA, a Finnish physicist by the name of Oli Oinenen, is in charge of uh, the verification, or if you wish, the inspection department of the IAEA. And the very basic idea of the IAEA is that uh, we, the IAEA, are in this universe to promote technology for nuclear technology for peaceful purposes, and we will provide you with funds, money, technology, know-how, cooperation, as long as you allowed us to inspect and verify the various countries around the globe which have nuclear facilities. If we are sure that these facilities are for uh, the right purposes, for peaceful purposes, we will help you. And uh, if not, uh, then uh, we will take measures against it. So in 2003, in March 2003, uh, a delegation of IAEA led by Oli Oinenen went to Tehran. They had already information that the Iranians were not telling the truth. The, the very basic uh, constitution of the IAEA is that countries that want to be members of the IAEA, and most countries of the world are, are members of the IAEA, uh, that they, those who are members, they would report back to IAEA about their nuclear activities, facilities, uh, materials, technology, and uh, the IAEA would take their word. Only if information comes to the IAEA from whatever sources, open sources or covered sources, then that something is going wrong in a particular country, then they would ask the country, and it's part of the agreement, that they can check and search and, and, and inspect. So, the delegation had an information that something was going wrong in Iran. They got information from various intelligence sources and organizations, uh, the CIA, the Israeli Mossad, I assume also the German BND, the British and other organizations that the Iranians actually are not reporting as they are obliged by the international agreements and by the, their agreement with IAEA about their nuclear activity. So the delegation went to Tehran, met with their Iranian colleagues, counterparts from the Iranian Atomic Energy Organization, and since they had a, a very concrete information about a particular address in, in the suburbs of Tehran, they asked to go to that particular place. Uh, so the Iranians try to, have, to, to delay them, ask them why do you want to go there, there is nothing there, but they insisted and they took them there to that address. When they came there, they, what they saw was a few buildings, it's a, it was a factory or a workshop, they saw a few buildings and the, the, 
the, the windows were very, very filthy. They couldn't see through the windows, but they barely saw through the windows that the windows, that the holes uh, in, in, the, in these buildings were filled up with boxes, carton boxes. They asked to, to go inside, and the Iranians said, oh, we don't have the key, the guy with the key is now abroad, and they didn't allow them to go inside. They went back to the hotel, they talked to the Iranian counterparts, and, and went back to Vienna. Three weeks later, once again, they decided that they want to, to, to visit the place, and the Iranians allowed them. And there was a miracle. They went to the place, and all the buildings were new, painted, uh, even, which was something, uh, very, very unusual for Iran, even when they went to the toilets, the electricity came up without even touching the, you know, the bottoms. It was really re renovated, everything was new, modern, and the, the IAA inspectors and Oli Oinenen uh, told themselves what a miracle in three weeks, suddenly out of the blue, this place which was filthy, dirty, <coughs> empty with boxes, suddenly is a workshop. So they asked them, what do you have here? And the Iranians said, this is an electrical factory. And indeed, in the attics, there were boxes and boxes of nice, very nice clocks. So Oli Oinenen asked them, can we have this can I, can, I have, can I buy this clock? And the Iranians said, oh no, don't, you don't have to buy it. We'll give it to you free. It's our gift, you are our guest. He, he insisted and he paid for it and it's hanging on his wall. Now, this place that they visited actually was called the Kalaya Electrical Workshop, was the place where the Iranians were manufacturing and producing centrifuges. They were doing the, they were producing these centrifuges based on drawings, on plans that they bought from the, from the Pakistanis, secretly, without declaring, without reporting to the IAEA. From the famous network, smuggling network of Dr. Abdel Kader Khan, <coughs> Who, who was and still is considered in Pakistan to be the father of the Pakistani atomic bomb, and he went into retirement, and then after he uh, decided that what he did to his country, he would do now to his own uh, fortune. And he was traveling in the Middle East, like a salesman, and going to various countries in the Middle East and telling them, look, I know how to produce a nuclear bomb. Do you want one? And he went to Egypt, he went to Syria, he went to Saudi Arabia, and all these countries said, no, thank you. But the Iranians said, yes, please. And he was selling them his know-how and his technology and his drawings. And based on these drawings of how to produce centrifuges, the Iranians started producing them in this workshop, which suddenly turned into electrical, uh, uh, clo uh, electrical clock factory. This is a typical, uh, classical example of the Iranian nuclear program. They have been doing it for 18 years secretly, uh, without reporting to, as they are supposed to do to the IAEA. And, and once they were confronted with the information that actually they are breaching, violating their obligations, their international commitments, their agreements with IAEA, they were first saying, no, there is no such a thing. They were lying and denying. And then when they were confronted with more information, they were saying, oh yes, but this is not what you think it is. This is not a workshop for centrifuges. This is a, a factory for clocks. And I can describe to you place by place over the last 
decade in which they were doing the same thing. There is, a there is another story, this is the story of the centrifuge. <coughs> they produced the centrifuges in that Kalaya workshop, and then they moved them to Natanz, when now they are enriching uranium. But first, when they were confronted with the information that they were building a factory in Natanz, which is 250 kilometers south of Tehran, they were saying, no, such a place doesn't exist. I mean, Natanz exists, but there is no factory there. No, there is no pl plant for enriching uranium there. So they were shown satellite imagery, which the IAEA received either from some intelligence organizations or even from commercial satellites. You know that there are eight countries in the world which are selling, sat have satellites in space and they are selling the commercial uh, imagery, photos. Anyone can buy it. Uh, so they were showing what is this. It looks like a factory, like a kind of a chemical factory, so it must be a factory. So the Iranians said, oh, well, maybe, and this is the pattern. No, denial, maybe, but it's not what you think it is. And then they said, okay, yes, it is a factory. This is a chemical plant. Yes, this is a plant for enriching uranium, but it is not what you think we, it, it is. You, it's not for, linked to our nuclear program. And, and I can go and on and on and tell you story after story. The most amazing story is a, a laptop, the story of a laptop. A, 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 an Iranian scientist uh, who worked with a certain intelligence organization, was recruited by a certain Western intelligence organization, provided a laptop in which, con in, in which contained drawings, very elaborate drawings. And it gave it uh, to his controllers. It, it was brought here to Germany in 2004, given to the BND. They looked at it, evaluated it, didn't, were not sure about the drawings, what is the real nature of the drawings. So it was sent to the CIA, who sent it to the laboratories in Los Alamos, famous laboratories, and to Livermore Laboratories near San Francisco. <coughs> which are the major two national nuclear laboratories of the U.S. government. And they reached the conclusion that what the, the laptop contained was drawings of how to test a, a nuclear explosion. The drawings were in Farsi. So, so when, after a year and something, when this information was eventually reaching IAA, the IAA inspection team led by Oli Oydenen went to the Iranians and showed them. They said, oh no, there is no such a thing as a laptop coming out of Iran. So the inspection said, but here it is. They said, well, this is a fabrication. It's not ours. This, is, this has been fabricated by the Mossad, by the CIA, by the Germans, by the British. The Iranians believe that the whole world is against them, so they are victims and it was fabricated. Okay, fabricated, fabricated, but eventually they were confronted with more information. They said, okay, okay, so maybe the drawings are genuine, authentic, but it has nothing to do with nuclear. Had it been in nu uh, nuclear drawings, related to a nuclear explosion and test, it wouldn't be in Farsi. It would have been in Paki in Urdu or in Korean, because the North Koreans were also helping the, uh, the, the Iranians. So now they are saying, yes, we bought something from Pakistan. Two years ago they said, nothing. We have no connection with the Pakistanis. Eventually they said, okay, maybe it's in Farsi, maybe it's authentic, but it has nothing to do with nuclear. It is a test for a, rev a, a missile re-vehicle. Re you know, when you, we, when you send a, a three-stage missile into orbit, into space, it has several parts, so there is a re-entry vehicle. 
it was a real drawings of how to test a nuclear explosion. So what we see is a pattern, a very consistent pattern of the Iranians breaching their obligations to the IAEA, then lying, then denying, then coming up with excuses. And you know, like in, like in, in our daily life when we lie, and we don't want to admit something, then we have to cover the lie with another lie, and another lie. And we have layers of lies, which all together, eventually, we are, we are intelligent in a web of lies, and we are already, we don't know how we started, and we are telling lies after lies after lies, and all these lies are making it quite certain that actually the truth is coming out. And that's how the Iranian nuclear program more or less was, was revealed. That for 18 years the IAEA and the international community didn't, didn't think that the Iranians were doing, they were building facilities and buying and purchasing uh, material and equipment for a nuclear program. It began, it started with the Shah, but then there was the Islamic Revolution, and the Islamic Revolution had other things in mind to be bothered with, uh, to cement the Islamic Revolution from 79 and on in Iran. Then they had this terrible war with Iraq, which was, uh, we have to admit, it, it was initiated by Saddam Hussein and Iraq, who believed that Iran would be weak and it's after a revolution, and, and the army was broken. Iranian army was broken, so he believed that he would just walk uh, like a, a day walk and, and take over uh, uh, Iran. So they were busy with the war, they were busy with the cementing the revolution, but at a certain stage around 85, while the war was still going on, they decided also to, to rebuild their nuclear program, which began with the, nuclear sh with, with the Shah. Now, under the Shah, everyone in the world was ready to support the Iranians. Because the Shah was an ally of the West, of America, of Germany, German companies, Siemens, French companies, American companies were just ready to build the Shah and Iran with nuclear facilities because they thought, this guy is ours, he's our ally. Maybe he's a bastard, but he's our bastard and we would handle it. So the Ayatollahs, when after coming to power, a few years later, they decided to, re, to reignite, to restart the nuclear program. And they started, and they did it step by step. They purchased some equipment for China, some equipment for Pakistan, as I told you, missiles from missile technology and missiles from North Korea. <coughs> Once you have you would have a bomb, you need means of delivery. How you would deliver the bomb? How you so you can either deliver it from an airplane or usually by as a warhead from a missile. And slowly they were doing it under the under the radar screens of the of the world, including the IAA, including the CIA, including the Mossad. And then, luckily, in 2001, 2002, some sort, some basic information was reaching the West through Iranian uh, opposition sources, through agents working for uh, Western uh, intelligence organizations that were telling them these stories about what they were building in Natanz, the factory in Natanz, and the Kalaya electrical, supposedly electrical workshop, and then that they were building something in a place called Arak. Arak, uh, 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 they building the, a nuclear reactor, a real nuclear reactor, which eventually would produce plutonium. And the Iranians were, when they were confronted, they were trying to, 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 to stall time, delay time, uh, but consistently they continued working towards their aim and purpose and ambition, which is to, to be a nuclear power. 
And all these have, I would say, luckily, miraculously changed when Ahmadinejad came to power. Why miraculously? Because the previous president, the supposedly moderate Khatami, the reformist Khatami, was doing exactly the same, but he was doing it in a more nice way. He was not that rigid, he was not that, he was not expressing extremist views. But when Ahmadinejad came to power in 2005, all the masks were exposed. What he was, what Khatami was doing secretly, but didn't say it, Ahmadinejad continued doing it secretly, but also was speaking up his mind, was expressing it openly. And now, for almost four years after he came to power, in, we are almost in 2009, we are on the verge of a very dramatic, historic event. Iran is very close to have the, the material and rich uranium, or, although it is low and rich uranium, but they can turn it quickly into a highly enriched uranium. They have the material, they have the equipment, they have the know-how, they have the technology to produce their first nuclear bomb or device. Now, there are a lot of experts who argue when this, some, some people in Israel, in the all, in, a few years ago, the Israeli intelligence called it the point of no return when the Iranians would reach this point of no return. Later on, the Israeli intelligence changed the term into technological threshold. When they will cross this technological line. So there are a lot of arguments about this question. There are a lot of several answers. But it is agreed that the Israeli intelligence, you may say, is, is and, the, and the state of Israel, you may say, is very alarmist, and rightly so. Because we are the first to, to be suffering from nuclear Iran. We are at the receiving end of Iran's threats, of Ahmadinejad's talk about uh, the need to erase Israel from the map of the world, that the Jews that should go to, it, to other places that Israel doesn't have the right to exist. So being on the receiving end, it's quite natural that Israel is more alarmist than, let's say, Germany. But the Israeli estimate is that next year, by the end of next year, maybe in 2010, at latest, Iran would have all these components together, and they would be able, they, have the, they would have the material, the equipment, the uh, the know-how, the technology, to produce their first nuclear bomb. The CIA believes that maybe it would be later, maybe in 2012, 2013, maybe even 2015, six years from now. The German BND Research Department thinks that it would be in somewhere in between, maybe 2012, 2013. But we are very, very close to that point, to this technological threshold or, or the point of no return. Now, what can be done about it? You may say, so what? So Iran would have the bomb. There are several countries in the world which do have the bomb. First of all, five of, of these countries are legitimately recognized by the international community as having the right to have the bomb. This is the Soviet Union, or the, now Russia, uh, United States, France, China, and the UK. It is part of the UN acceptance. These are the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, those who have the veto powers. Then you have to other countries which openly, eventually, after secretly developing the bomb, after a few more years, openly, officially declared that they have the bomb. This is India, 
and Pakistan. Then you have Israel, which, is, which has the bomb, but never admitted it, and has applied a policy which is known as ambiguous po policy. It, it was defined already in 63, um, in the words of uh, Shimon Peres, then he was a, a young deputy, uh, deputy uh, minister of defense, in a meeting with President Kennedy, he said Israel would not be the first country to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East because he was pressed by Kennedy uh, to give an answer whether we have the bomb or not. So he, he evaded it, he avoided the answer, the question by saying we would not be the first one to introduce or to declare that we have the bomb in the Middle East. Then you have North Korea, which is playing kind of a cat and mouse game with uh, with its neighbors, South Korea, Japan, China, Russia, in America. They have the bomb, they don't have the bomb, they produce plutonium, they, they decide that they would, do, would stop producing plutonium in return for economic, uh, uh, financial and, and economic help. And then you have Iran. But what is the difference? The difference is that, for example, Israel, uh, first, has never admitted that it has the bomb, Secondly, as Israel has never threatened its neighbors. Israel is not saying that, I don't know, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the Palestinians, or the Iranians don't have a right to exist. But the Iranians are saying it. And even more loudly now, since Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is in power. And not only then, not only that, is, he belongs to a circle of or a quarter in, in Iran which, believe, which is, believes in the coming of the Messiah. Now, it is shared, this notion of the coming of the Messiah is, is shared by all the three monotheist religions. We have it in Judaism, we have it, you have it in Christianity, the second coming, doesn't matter how you, how you call it, how you define, but this, it's more or less the same pattern. The coming of the Messiah which would bring whatever on, on our air, earth and pre peace and prosperity and, 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 and stability and would change the world. However, in the Shiite tradition, as it is in other traditions as well, this idea sometimes is, is based on, on another notion. The Messiah would come only after a colossal calamity, Armageddon. Gog and Magog in, 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 in Jewish Hebrew tradition. And the same is in the Shia uh, tradition. So, and Ahmadinejad, this is the president of the state. This is not a, a renegade, an isolated uh, priest or ayatollah. This is a mainstream. This is the president of the country. And he believes in the coming of the Messiah. And if you believe in the coming of the Messiah, it means that he would come only after a major war, a huge war. Now, you have the president who believes in the Messiah. After, after a major calamity, disaster, war. And he is, the, he is the president who believes that Iran should have a nuclear bomb, which maybe, maybe can help him can help Iran to enhance the coming of the Messiah, to help the Messiah to come. So I, what shall I tell you? I would hesitate to, to be in a neighborhood in which you have a country which having the nuclear bomb and to trust that country and its leadership that maybe they'll use it, maybe they will not. I don't want to be at the mercy of, of President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and his likes that maybe they'll have the bomb and they will not use it. Now, what is the time frame? We said 2009, 2010, maybe 2012. What can be done about it? Now, there are several possibilities. One, we have to look at certain events which are very near. In February, in, 
In January, Barack Obama is going to is is is, is moving into the White House. Is is going to be sworn as the president. In February, we are having elections in Israel. In May, there are elections in Iran for presidency. It is, Iran is in is is in in despair as a country as a nation. They have a huge economic crisis, despite their revenues from oil. Iran is one of the poorest, it's, it's hard to believe, but Iran is one of the poorest countries in the world. They have one of the largest number of drug addicts, of prostitutes, prostitution. Uh, their official inflation is 25%, but it's probably 50 or 60. They have a huge rate of unemployment. Every year, nearly half a million Iranians leave, leave the country, and another half million would like to leave, but they don't have visas to go abroad. And Iran is one of the most polluted countries in the world. Half of the country is illiterate, maybe more. They don't have electricity in, in 60, 70% of Iran, in the rural areas. So what you hear is the boosting of the president. We are a strong, we are a power, but Iran is not that strong. And, and the Iranians, with their birth rate, which is very, very high, uh, with a population of 70 million people, uh, lives in a, in, a, in, a, in a very desperate situation. People are very unhappy and especially about Ahmadinejad, who came in 2005 as a president with the promise that he would, that he would repair the economy. He said it in, in his own words, I would put Iranian oil on every Iranian table or family. In other words, every family of Iran would enjoy the benefits of us being a major oil producer. We have a lot of revenues and, but, since he came to power, the situation is even worse. And I didn't mention the problems of housing and the problems of, of uh, subsidies that were cut and many, many other problems. So maybe Ahmadinejad, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, will not be elected as a president. It depends on the true ruler of Iran, which is the supreme leader or the spiritual leader. Iran is a theocracy. Don't forget it. It's a theocracy, it's not dem democracy. They have democratic elections, they have democratic processes, but when there is a contradiction between religion and state, between law, religious law and civil law, then the, religion, the religious law, the religion has the upper end. And the leader by constitution of Iran is the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, who, who succeeded Khomeini. So it's up to Khamenei, maybe at the last moment in April, March, he would decide that, that because Ahmadinejad is so hated by the public, that he would not be allowed to run. Because I told you it's a theocracy, it's not a full democracy. So there is a kind of a vetting committee. It's a council of, of sages, of elderly ayatollahs who decide who can run for elected offices and who cannot run. Whether it's a judge or a, or a board of education or a mayor of a, or a governor or a member of parliament or the president. So they decide, they may decide that we don't, they'll find the excuse. They are very good with excuses. They'll find the excuse, you are not fit for the job and we ban him from running for a second term. Or he may run, but Khamenei and his people would spread the, the message, we don't want him to be re-elected. And he would not be elected. So there, there is this possibility. But if he is elected, then what, can, what is going to happen? Now, already the world, the international community, decided via the UN Security Council to impose sanctions on Iran. 
three sets of sanctions for, uh, since 2006, December 2005. <coughs> but these sanctions are very weak. They are targeting 50 individuals in Iran, co military commanders, people who are involved in the nuclear program, people who are involved in the missile program, and companies which are involved in these two programs, the missile and the nuclear program. These are weak and these are not very effective. If you want to really change the mind of Iran, you need to impose tougher sanctions on them, and especially to hit them on, in their pockets. And the, the Iranian pocket is the oil and the gas industry, which is already in shambles, in deep troubles. Just, just one example, 15% of the Iranian oil production is wasted because their equipment, their equipment is very, very old. So there are leaks in the pipes, the equipment is not adequate, and, and they're losing a lot of oil even before they, they refine it, or even before they, 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 they sell it abroad. So if you hit them in their pocket, in their major in source of income, then they might Think twice. Is it worth to have a nuclear program? Is it worth to go against most of the world or no? But if sanctions of that sort are not imposed, and probably they are not going to impose because there is no international consensus and the Russians and the Chinese are playing a double game. Uh, they don't want Iran to be nuclear, but on the other hand, they are pro they the Russians are selling Iran with a lot of material, a uh, lot of equipment and, and stuff for their nuclear program. And the Chinese are buying Iranian oil. So I don't think they'll join the West. And there are other interests, Russian and Chinese interests, and they don't see eye in eye with the West. So I don't think the, Iran the Chinese and the Russians will, 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 will join the demand, the call for, a for tougher sanctions. So if the sanctions don't put in place tough sanctions, then there is a military option. And when it comes to the military option, the question is first, is it only a theoretic theoretical option well, the, or it is a practical option? What are the, uh, who can do it, who will do it, and what are the consequences? What would be the results of such a such a thing? And this is a tough question. Now, a, a military action theoretically is possible, but also practically. Of course, the best force to 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 execute a military uh, strike against Iran's nuclear facilities is the United States. But the United States is not going to do it, at least not in the near future. Why? Because Bush wanted it. But I don't. I I would spare. I would spare your time about talking about Bush and its mistakes. Uh, above all, the invasion of Iraq, and now the United States is stuck in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And, uh, and Bush, who wanted to hit Iran, is not, do is not going to do it. And time is running out anyway. In, in 50 days, he's out and Barack Obama is in. And Barack Obama already said that, first of all, he, he wants <coughs> to, to try to exhaust the, uh, the, the diplomatic option before thinking about a military so, so obviously, when we have in mind that he would be a president in, in January, then it will take him two, three months to form his team and to formulate his policy. Then we have the Israeli elections, then we have the Iranian elections. So nothing will happen before the Iranian elections because any attack on Iran before the elections would play into the hands 
of the radicals and the and the ayatollahs, the radical ayatollahs and Ahmadinejad and his likes. So nothing will happen there until then. And then probably Obama and the United States will be engaged in in a diplomatic in, in negotiations, in talks with Iran to try to convince them maybe you should abandon your nuclear program. So we are now in August or in the, in the summer of 2009. <laughs> this is the diplomatic track or the international track. Then you have the technological track. In the meantime, Iran is making more progress. Is is achieving more uh, know-how, is, is producing more material, and is, re and is getting closer to that, uh, to that point, technological threshold or line or point of no return. Now, what about Israel? Israel has less capabilities of attacking Iran's nuclear site. We have a small... And when you talk about attacking Iran, you can do it mainly by missiles and by the Air Force. Whether it's America or, or even Germany, no one would send forces there. So it would be by the Air Force and, and missiles. Now, Israel obviously has a smaller capabilities than the United States. We have a strong Air Force, we have an experienced Air Force, a uh, very reputable Air Force, but it's small. So, the magnitude of a, a theoretical Israeli operation against Iran would be smaller, would be limited. Amer America can conduct a, 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 a battle, a war, for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks against Iran, hitting them time and again, time and again, sending missiles, sending airplanes, and, and Israel is capable of doing it only on a very limited time. On, on a, maybe to conduct a, a, a battle of two days, three days, maybe four days. And the distance is not that close between Israel and, 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 uh, and Iran. However, Israel, and I can almost assure you, I mean, I think you can take my word, because I know Israel, uh, I, that Israel would not do it without coordinating the, any any thinking about the military attack with the United States. For Israel, the relations with America, which are strategic, historic, and, and uh, going, uh, and basically are the, are the main force which enables to the, state, to the state to exist, these relations are that so important to Israel that Israel would not do anything which would be interpreted as standing against the interest of America. And therefore, I, I, maybe some of you read in the last few weeks of, that in, in the twilight times, between, between the change of the administrations, in other words, nowadays, maybe in November, after the U.S. election, maybe in December, maybe in, this, in January, before Barack Obama moves into the White House, Israel would take this opportunity when it is a twilight time, the, there is a, so, some sort of a paralysis, paralysis in, in America that would take advantage of that situation and would attack Iran. As far as I know Israel, and as far as I understand Israeli politics, Israeli military, Israeli history, I don't think it's going to happen. So the, the number one Israeli imperative is that the relations with America are, are so important that they are more important than anything else, even the danger that Iran would eventually become nuclear. So Israel would not attack or would not think about attacking Iran without feeling, at least, that it's okay with America. It doesn't mean, you know, in international politics that America would tell Israel that's okay, that's fine. You can understand body language, you can understand between the lines, there are tacit understandings between nations that it's okay. I, we look the other side. Don't tell us. 
Don't tell us, but it's okay. And it happened before. So I don't see any, any military attack in the next year. By the end of that year, by the end of 2009, everything can happen. As I told you, these two tracks, channels, the technological channel, and the political, diplomatic, international channel are going to converge. And then anything is possible. Obama may do it. If he, if he reaches the conclusion that talking to the Iranians is, is, is a waste of time. And indeed, it would probably would be a waste of time. Iranians are not going to, I think, to surrender. But on the other hand, there might be a change in the Iranian thinking, especially if Ahmadinejad is not, is not uh, elected. Now, finally, I, I still believe that the option of sanctions, even if they are not imposed by the international community, only by individual states, is still a very useful tool to try to influence the process in Iran. And here it comes to Germany. The, the, Germany, I would say, is, is conducting a, a dual policy. On one hand, officially, uh, and not only officially, diplomatically, the government is a strong opponent of, the, of Iran and its nuclear program. This government is a, is, has joined all the major uh, decisions by the UN and by other bodies against Iran's nuclear program. But, and imposed and joined the sanctions against Iran. But these are weak sanctions. On the other hand, the government is kind of tr turning a blind eye and allowing a lot of German corporations and a lot of German companies and a lot of German businessmen to do business with Iran. I believe that most of them are not selling to the Iranian nuclear program because that would be illegal. And if there are some elements here and there, they are, they are, they are going to be chased, arrested, prosecuted by, your, by the German authorities if, they are, if they get them. But by allowing tremendous number of, G of German companies to do business with Iran, even not in the nuclear field, even not in the missile field, but let's say en the energy field, you contribute to the strengthening of the regime. And by, and by strengthening the regime, you give the regime the, the feeling, the confidence that they can get away with the sanctions, and with the international community desire not to see nuclear Iran, and they defy the international sanctions, they defy uh, the international community, and they continue with their nuclear program. Thank you.